All right, this lecture tonight is about unified physics and scalar energy. Now, you probably have no idea what I just talked about, but it, when we go through this, you'll, you'll fully understand what this is and what it means with health. So this is Nassim Haramin. He's a physicist in Hawaii, and he figured out what's called the unified theory or unified physics. So we have math that describes the planets and how they interact with each other, and then we have math that describes atoms and protons and neutrons and how they interact with each other. So theoretically, the big math with the planets and the small math with the atoms should be the same. And they haven't been. And there's been dozens or hundreds of physicists for a long, many, many decades trying to figure out what's called the unified theory. So Nassim Haramin has figured it out. And he's brilliant like Einstein and didn't do very well in school, but started, you know, talk, thinking about physics when he was in ninth grade, ninth grade, I'm sorry, when he was nine years old. And um, so he has all kinds of papers published and equations to back it up. And it makes sense when you see it, we're going we're gonna to see it. You're going to actually see the, what the unified um, physics is. So, Carrie. So it starts, it actually starts with a dot. Okay, now the, the unified Physics has a structure to it. It starts with a dot, and then there's other structures that we're going to put together, and then you'll see what it is. This is the next structure. This is called a tetrahedron. And it's Plato from ancient Greece described what's called the platonic solids. This is the smallest of the platonic solids. What that means is um, the platonic solids have equal size and equal angles and equal lines. Okay, so this is a tetrahedron. This is not a pyramid. A pyramid has four sides and a base. That would be called an, um, well, half of an octahedron, but this has three sides and a base, Carrie. So the next structure is two tetrahedrons put together and see how you have one that's pointing up and one that's pointing down like this, and these are the edges. So there's just two tetrahedrons smushed together and they're rotated against each other. So it looks like that. And if you put a bunch, and I'm skipping through a whole bunch of um, processes that Nassim had to go through in his mind with geometry and geometric shapes to figure out the unified uh, physics. So if you put 64 tetrahedrons together, this is what the structure looks like. It's, it's called the 64 tetrahedron grid or 64 tetrahedron matrix, and that's what it is, Carrie. So what this, this right here, now when I give this lecture in, you know, elsewhere, I spend 15, 20 minutes talking about this structure and how it, how it was assembled to get, you know, to get here and why and how it obeys all of Mother Nature's rules and stuff. But this is the 64 tetrahedron grid. It's the geometry of the fabric of space-time. Okay, so what is space-time? It's what's between my hands. Okay, and I'm not talking about oxygen or carbon dioxide or the dust that's floating between my hands. I'm talking about space. So if this was a vacuum between my hands, there's still something there. It's something that you can't see, but it has a structure. And this is part of the structure. So it's like when you look outside, you can't see the wind. Nobody has ever seen wind but you can see the effects of wind. Okay, I'm going to show you the effects of the geometry of space-time. So next. All right, now, if you take um, each one of these um, tetrahedrons, all 64 of them, and you put a sphere around them, and then you shine a light from above down, this is the shadow that gets cast. So you have circles, and you have um, part of the um, tetrahedrons like this. See that structure right there? Okay, this is called the flower of life. And here's another representation of it. That's the flower of life. Now, you would think that if this is a representation of the fabric of space or space-time or the vacuum, whatever term you want to use, if this is you know, a representation of the fabric of that, you would think that maybe somebody else discovered this long before Nassim figured it out, like 12 years ago, or whenever he figured it out. And if, it, if somebody did figure it out, 
and it was this important, maybe they put it in their architecture or in their art so that we could remember it or know that it's significant. Carrie? So these are two um, <clears throat> flowers of life that are in the stone structure of the temple of Osiris in Egypt, which is 10,000 years old. Now, these are not drawn in with a charcoal pencil. They're not chiseled in with the hammer and chisel. These are like lasered into the structure of the stone. And they're big. And they're really high up. They're like 15 feet up from the ground of what the temple is right now. So this is 10,000 years old that somebody put these uh, flower of life symbols in the temple of Osiris. <clears throat> These are flowers of life symbols in two temples from hundreds of years ago. One's in India, the other one's in Turkey. So this is like something that people have figured out worldwide a long time ago, and we, st and we still see it. <clears throat> this is the Forbidden City in China from 1400 AD. These are the food dogs that guard the secret. And here's the secret. It's the flower of life. And there's other food dogs in the Forbidden City that are guarding the flower of life in a spherical form. So, next one. All right, so moving on. So now you know the, gar the flower of life and you know about the tetrahedron. And I mentioned the first part is always this, this, the dot in the center. So um, now we're going to add more to the structure of space. Okay, and I wrote at the top, adding the torus field and vector equilibrium. So go to the next. Okay, this is a torus field. It's like a big donut or, or a small donut, and it, and it spins. Okay, but it has a hollow center. Next. And this is a st statue put outside of a building at Stony Brook University. And you can tell that they put a little twist in this one. See the little twist in this torus? Okay. Here's a torus field here, and then another one here. And you can see it too with a slice of an orange, like if you cut an orange in the same way. So this is like a, nate, you know, uh, a representation of what the torus field is like in an apple or a piece of fruit next. And this would be the torus field between the branches of the roots of a tree. And you could also do the same torus field all around the outside of the tree from top to bottom like this. Okay, next. This is the Earth and the uh, magnetic field. The magnetic field is actually torus. And you can see it. And this is true for batteries, you know, a, a magnetic um, block. And you put I iron shavings around it, it'll form that torus structure. So you notice how we went from really small to really big. Next. So this is the supercluster that we live in. This is trillions of planets and galaxies and stuff. We're somewhere in the middle. And you can't see the torus field of this supercluster, next one. But when you put our neighboring supercluster you know, right up against us, you can see the torus field right there. So this is a supercluster. So what I'm, sh what I'm showing you is that nature, that space, has a structure. And then it moves matter to meet the structure's demands. So the physics controls the matter. Now, as a doctor, I studied lots of biology and lots of chemistry, and I had a little bit of physics, but I didn't have this phys physics because it didn't exist. The unified theory is the ultimate physics that all these people have been trying to discover, and now here it is available through Nisim's foundation in Hawaii, the Resonance um, Foundation. So, but the physics comes first, then the chemistry, then the biology. So that's the order in which all doctors, all healthcare providers need to study their profession. Physics, then chemistry, then biology. Because if physics controls chemistry, then chemistry is what makes up biology. Yeah, go ahead. And then this is, um, these are maps of superclusters. I don't know how they did this, but each one of these is another supercluster. And you can tell that in space, they actually form into what's called octahedrons. So you have like a pyramid facing up and a pyramid facing down, put their bases together, that's an octahedron. 
So you have two octahedrons. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Next. And it goes on. These are more superclusters all mapped out, and they form, they form a geometric pattern. Next. Okay, so getting back now to biology and our human body, here's a torus around a healthy body, and what they're showing, here's that dot, the original center that I was talking about before, and then you have this um, torus field that goes around it, and it's hollow in the middle. This is the energy field. This is what's around every animal and plant. Next. This is a sick torus field and a sick person. You got like this black cloud right here, and this color isn't very strong, and the whole torus field itself is smaller. Okay, next. So you want your torus field to be big, and then your biology gets healthier. So the energy starts first, and then the body become, comes second. The body is second. What I need you to do is just tap on this, and it'll start to rotate. So this is the torus field, and it rotates and it spins. Okay, there's torque to it. So you can see it's not just going like this, like if you take a donut and just start spinning it this way. It spins this way, and there's rotation around it like this. So this is how... This is how it flows. You got that? This is just a um, representation of that. Okay, now torque is 98% of the energy of the universe. That was a huge missing piece of information that all these physicists had, had, had missed before. And uh, Nissim figured it out. Next. Okay, so now here, here is the purple um, torus field like that. And just think of that, that's the energy. Think, think of that as like a bubble. And then we have this skeletal structure that's on the inside. And this is called the vector equilibrium. Okay, now I showed you that 64 tetrahedron. Right in the center of that is this vector equilibrium. Okay, now Buckminster Fuller coined that term. And he was all into geometry and stuff. And every single one of these lines is exactly the same length. And there's 12 points all around. And if you draw a line from each point to the center, all those lines are exactly the same length. That's why it's in total equilibrium. Okay, so this is the, the basic uh, geometry structure of, of equilibrium. Okay, now if space was not in equilibrium, you would have explosions and implosions everywhere. Okay, so now, um, okay, next, Carrie. All right, so let's, let's get into how this is actually formed. We're going to go through this pretty quickly. But we have this, um, um, this tetrahedron made out of other tetrahedrons, and then another one that's exa exactly the same but flipped upside down. And they each have their torus field like this. And we're, what we're going to do is we're going to smoosh them together. Co next one. Okay, now they're smooshed together, and now you have a double torus field. You have this equator right here, and this is the beginning of the formation of that 64 tetrahedron grid. There's the dot in the center. This, we'll call it a singularity or a black hole. I'll get into black hole here in a second. Next one. Okay, so we're forming the 64 tetrahedron, and in the middle is that vector equilibrium structure. Next one. Okay, so... So get, getting rid of, now you can't see, like I said, you can't see these structures, but you can only see the effect of them. So we're taking the structures away, and now you're seeing what's, what happens. Next one. You have the formation of like a universe or like a galaxy. Okay, so there's still a double, I know this is kind of faint, but there's a double torus. There's an equator here, and you have this black hole in the center. Okay, next one. And then you've got these big rotating arms. You can see the torus field. You can see these vortices going up like that. And you have this, this uh, torus field around. And the outer edge is called the event horizon. It's like the envelope that goes around it. Um, now let me talk about the black hole right now. So the old definition of a black hole was this big vacuum in space that sucked in all light and all matter and crushed it to death. And you don't want to go near it. That is not what a black hole is. What a black hole is... It's the center of creation of all matter and energy. So it's creation. 
Okay, now it does have, it's in equilibrium, it's in the center of that vector equilibrium, so it does take stuff in and then it also pushes stuff out. So it pushes stuff out this way and it takes stuff in this way. So it's got, you know, explosion and implosion going on in total equilibrium all the time. See, see, see how that goes? Okay, now remember there's, there's two um, torus fields here. There's an equator around here. So the explosion like this out or like out like that, that is what is really the Big Bang Theory. So decades ago, they saw this. And they said, oh, at one point there was nothing, and then suddenly there was everything. Well, that's not really true, because there was something before the Big Bang, and that was the black hole. But what was before, you know, this is the beginning right here. So this goes out, and then it goes up and back in. Or it'll go out and then down and back in, okay, on both sides, all around in three dimensions, okay? Now... I mentioned that this is the center of all creation of energy and matter. How many new stars are made every day in our, out there? 275 million new stars are made every new day, every day. So there's a lot of production going on in here. And these things are spinning because there's torque. Remember, you, you saw the torque going on. And these big arms will start to get wobbly and then something will fall off and then it becomes an equilibrium again, like that. So you have new planets leaving the event horizon, leaving the boundary. So, okay, next one. All right, this is actually from NASA, and it's a galaxy. And you can see back there, there's the black hole. You can see this vortex, the vortices coming up, like the vortex up here and down here. You can see the, um, the edge of the double torus field. You, get, you, you can see the anatomy of it, right? Go to the next one. 17 years later, NASA took a picture of this again. It's the same galaxy. And this was this year when they took this picture. So you can see the amount of growth and the energy and the matter that came out of this black hole on both sides. The whole thing is bigger. Not just the vortex up and down, but the whole thing is bigger too. And then you have these structures right here. So this is 17 years of of creation of new energy and, and new matter. So, next. So we're looking like really big. We got these big, big concepts of what's going on with energy and the torus field and the structures and all that kind of stuff. Okay, next one. But now we're gonna go smaller and you're gonna see the same exact thing. So here we have the black hole of this hurricane and it's creating energy you know, thousands and thousands of, of tons of water spinning around and destroying homes and stuff like that. This, it's just, this is space telling matter what to do. Space is telling these clouds, you're going to start spinning because I'm spinning and I control you. Next. Now this is a carbon atom. And you can see it also has the spiral arms around it. See that? So from very, very large to very, very, very small, it's the same structure, it's the same activity. All right, now the whole point is that this is creating matter and energy. And our bodies follow these same rules. They've, our bodies follow the rules of physics and space-time. So if everything was going very well, our bodies would heal, but you can have interferences causing a lack of healing. So those interferences stop the energy from doing what it needs to do. Okay, next. All right, here's our, here's a, we're, we're talking about the body now. Okay, so the, um, the three-dimensional uh, structure of space-time can also be represented in two dimensions. And that's actually mathematically called the Fibonacci series or the phi ratio or the pi ratio. So there's different um, ways to say it, but they're, and they're, they're different mathematically just by a little bit, they're, but they're equal enough that we can talk about them equally. And there's a ratio of 1 to 1.618. That's the ratio. So the bottom line is like this part of the finger is um, 1.618 1. smaller. Am I getting that right? 
1.618 smaller than this part, which is 1.618 smaller than that, which is 1.618 smaller than that. So that's the math in our, in our body, our, our anatomy. Next one. And it's, and it's represented by the spiral like this, like a, like a shell on the, you know, at the beach. So these squares right here are 1.618 larger than the previous square. That's just what it turns out to be. And you can see like the torque going on there. Go to the next one. All right, so our DNA absolutely follows the, uh, the pi ratio or the phi ratio or Fibonacci sequence. So here, these numbers are part of that sequence. 1, 21, 34, and then 0.618 here, 0.618 there, 0.382 there. So when you look at the spiral of our DNA, it's just, I'm just saying that the DNA follows what physics, what space tells it to do. Yeah, next. All right, this is DNA looking at it like, like a hot dog, and you, you're looking at it long ways like this. So it's kind of hollow in the center, and it's a cross-section is what, what I'm looking for. But um, photons live right there. Photons uh, are stored in the center of DNA. Okay, next. Oh, back up. I'm sorry. Back up a little bit. So the f I'm, I, I mentioned photons because what are photons? Photons are that same structure that I showed you with the big spiraling arms and the double torus field and the vor vortices and the black hole, all that stuff. So photons are the same thing as is like a proton and um, the body and a plant. They all follow the same structure. So photon, there's a guy named uh, Fritz Albert Popp in Germany. He's been studying photons for 30, 40 years. And he defined photon as an event. The old definition of a photon is the matter of light, as opposed to a ray of light. Okay, but he says a photon is an event, which is absolutely fascinating. So a photon is in charge of 100,000 chemical reactions per second. And it turns on and turns off chemical reactions in our bodies at that speed. 100,000 per second. So it's really fast. And why would it be so fast? Because it's light and it travels at the speed of light, right? But it's more than just a you know, piece of particle or something or a ray. It knows what to turn on and turn off. It's an event. Okay. All right, next. It's fascinating. So, so our bodies are matter and it's made out of energy too. We have light in our bodies, and we have protons, we got new um, electrons. And all of these um, objects or events um, go from being a solid you know, piece of matter to, to energy. And they flip-flop back and forth. Our, the basis of our structure goes from matter to energy, back and forth, back and forth. So these are particles with a characteristic pattern. I'm sorry. The, what I'm looking for is... Um, this is from an electron scanning microscope, and here's a fingertip, and it says the tip of a human finger right here. But when they blew it up, you can see that there's not very much you know, definition between the finger and space. So it's, it kind of blends. So I'm just trying to show you that we're not totally matter. Okay, we have energy. Next. And then here's two people. These are fingertips, and this is with a Curlian camera, which means that it can pick up energy fields. And these people don't know each other, and they're forced to almost touch fingers. And you can see this ridge right here. See that brown ridge? They set that up because they don't know each other. Go to the next one. These are two people that like each other, and they know each other. And you can see that the blue, see you have purple, 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 purple. And here we have this blue, and there's this exchange of energy between these two people when they almost touch fingers. Okay, next. All right, and then I put this up because all these um, structures, like this green stuff and these bigger bands, and then in here, these twisted bands right here, they all carry energy. They're not just like, you know, bridges and roads. These are actually carriers of energy. And when I say energy, I'm not just saying like electrons. I'm talking about what do, like, 
more than that. I'm talking about information, not just electrons, but information. So um, there's a guy named Marcel Vogel who uh, studied um, crystals for IBM. He was an engineer for IBM basically his whole career. And he uh, put together uh, crystal radios and stuff. So back in the 1920s, um, crystal radios were on the market. And what they were is a piece of crystal with a metal band on it. And you could tune it. And you could hear the AM radio station coming right out of the crystal. There's no speakers. You didn't plug it into anything. There's no headphones, no, no tubes. Just the crystal was singing the song from the AM radio station. Now, the station has this tower sending the signal, and the crystal picked up on it and converted it to audio. Now, Marcel Vogel says that the crystals can store information, they can interpret information, they can transport it, they can do all, he listed out like seven or eight things that crystals can actually do. And it's really, really fascinating. But, um, so the point here is that um, Marcel was saying that when we carry, when we have information leave our brain and go to our foot, it's not just a bunch of electrons going down the nervous system. It's an image with um, taste and touch and sight and sound and smell. It's like a movie. It's like sending a movie to your foot. So I'm going to tell my foot to move, and I'm not just, okay, which electrons need to make it move. No, I'm just, I'm giving it this command that I'm going to move all my toes and I move my foot this way. So it's more like a movie amount of information. Does that make, se make sense? It's not just on-off digital like um, our technology today. Okay, so think of movies as being transported through these connected, this connective tissue. Movies of information. Yeah, next, Carrie. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the scalar laser that I have and scalar technology. So what this, um, this is a research paper written by a guy named Whitaker. Here he is, Whitaker, a physicist. He um, <clears throat> wrote it in 1903, and it was published in 1904 in the Proceedings of the London Mathematical Society. You can find this online. I got a copy of it. So what this does is it describes what scalar technology is, what a scalar waveform is. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so here it is. This is the scalar waveform. It's one version of it. It's one like description of it. And a better word for it really is longitudinal wave. Okay, so when you really look at the technical definition of scalar, it does not meet what this is. I don't know how scalar became the word for this description, but long, we're going to call it longitudinal wave. Okay, so what it is, it's like a slinky, and it's got this, this power that goes through the air like this, and you're, here you have compression like that, and here you have expansion. So compression, expansion, compression, expansion. This is what Nikola Tesla discovered, and he did most of his work between 1890 and 1894. He had a lab in New York City, he worked from 10 a.m. until 6 a.m. the next day, and then he went to bed, and he woke up four hours later, and he did that every day for like four years, and he did that kind of work. Now this is what we study in every school in the country and in the world. This is what physics says a wavelength is, only this, and this is called a transverse wave. So it goes up and down, up and down. And you have like amplitude, and you have a trough, and you have a you know, peak, and you can measure the distance between here and here. And um, the frequency of this transverse wave was described by a guy named Hertz. And uh, he published some papers. And then Nikola Tesla approached Hertz and said, you know what? This isn't really what's going on. This is what's going on. And then described this to Hertz and he said, yeah, you're right. I see what you're saying. And I guess Hertz was going to retract his papers about the transverse wave because this isn't the full science behind electricity and the transmission of waves. This is the science behind it. Okay, but by the time Hertz was going to retract his papers, all of industry was into this. Okay, and so and here's how you know this, because all the electricity is transmitted by wires 
through your backyard and cross country wires. This requires wires to go across space. This does not require any wires to go across space. So if Tesla had won this whole battle, we wouldn't have any wires around our, our land. And Tesla had actually built this big tower and he was going to transmit longitudinal waves from it to, you know, so people could then just put it like a stake in the ground, like a, a metal stake, and then wire it from the stake to their house and now they have electricity for free. Okay, because this would just, you know, um, energize that metal stake in the ground. But J.P. Morgan and other industrialists said, we don't want to do that because it's free. So we want our money. So, so they squashed Tesla. They took his money away. And, then, um, and he spent the next 20 years living in a hotel, feeding pigeons at Central Park in New York. And so, so that's why we have transverse waves, and that's why we need wires. Okay, now your cell phone and your garage door opener and your um, wireless, wirelessly um, controlled television, that, uh, that wireless stuff, that's, that's Tesla. He, and he's the guy that invented that. And I guess in the 1894, I think it was 1894 Chicago World Trade Center, he had a remote controlled boat in a big, big vat of water. And he's controlling this boat. You know, to us, it's not a big deal. But to them in 1894, 1898, I forgot the year, it was so strange, people completely ignored him. And nobody would even talk to him. But instead, they went to see Mr. Morse, because he had this Morse code thing. Dee, 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 and they, you know, they could understand that. So um, Tesla's a, you know, he's a good guy to study. Okay, so we're dealing with this longitudinal wave. So this, when it comes to the human body, is extremely important for healing. Whereas this is not. There's a lot of technology regarding this and healing. So there's electric pads you can put on muscles. There's red lasers. And um, Liz, can you grab a red laser for me? And um, there's all kinds of uh, insurance reimbursements for this. And, but this is basically not in existence in this country except for a few companies that, um, that I know of, and they're using this technology. Okay, now I've been using this technology now uh, for at least f four years, five years. Thanks. I just want to show you any light that's red, like that. See that red light? Any laser like this is this technology. I don't care how expensive it is. I don't care if the FDA approves it. I don't care if, like it, it helps, and it helps people. It heals, it reduces inflammation. The FDA approves these things for like seven or eight different things. There's even lasers for weight loss. It's temporary, but anyways, this is all the transverse, transverse wave. Okay, um, and then um, Liz, can you grab that Dirty Electricity book for me? And then so there's a book called Dirty Electricity written by an epidemiologist named Sam Milham, and he says that um, dirty, le dirty electricity is electricity, here's normal electricity, up and down, nice and smooth, up and down. Dirty electricity looks like this. And Sam Milham says this is the number one cause of cancer in the United States from day one, is dirty electricity. And here's that book. I'm a big fan of this book. Now in this book, he talks about Lou Gehrig. And Lou Gehrig, as a baseball player, went through a treatment called diathermy which is high amounts of electricity put into the body. And there's other athletes that got similar deep central nervous system diseases because they were always seeing a physical therapist and they were always getting electricity put into their body. So, and now, and I've, you know, there's foot baths and there's, there's all kinds of stuff that we're just putting electricity into the body. And once I read this book, I was like, even before this book, I'm like, I'm not so sure about this. It just doesn't make sense to me. But after reading this book, it's like, okay, we got to, you know, there's something going on here. And the truth is, this is old and it's, and it's um, not the best technology for healing the human body. Nor is it the best for transmitting energy through the, you know, through the air to energize your home for electricity. But this is right here, the scalar wavelength or waveform, otherwise known as a longitudinal waveform. Okay, so now this goes through the air like this. It's kind of like toruses, like a bunch of toruses stacked up, pushing through the air. 
So if you have a big uh, waveform coming out, you know, out of the out of the laser, here's the laser. This is the one that I have. Okay, I can turn it on, and then it sends a scalar waveform out, and that scalar energy does this. It looks at your body and it says, "Okay, I see that the liver needs help. I'm going to fix it," and then it fixes it. In the meantime, the liver just chugs along, and it's kind of dumb. And it does a lot of work, and there's a lot of biochemistry going on, but the liver's not fixing itself. Okay, now let me give you an analogy of this. So it's, the liver's like a car. It's got electricity, like the car battery. It's got chemistry, like gas and oil. And it works. It runs. But you've got to have a driver. And, you, and the driver maintains it, and the driver puts gas in it, and the driver gives it a fresh coat of paint. So the scalar waveform is like the driver, and the liver is like the car, okay? So cars are cool, and they have some, they're just cool. So are livers, but you gotta have more intelligence to actually get it functioning perfectly. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So um, now, um, one more thing about this scalar waveform. The way that it's made, what, what you do is you take two of these transverse waves and you invert them to each other and then they meet and then they cancel each other out. So this is the key. This is why I talked about the unified physics at the beginning. Because when you have a whole bunch of dirty electricity in the air, it may interfere with your body's ability to heal. I've seen this over and over again. So if you are able to cancel out all the dirty electricity, all the radio frequencies, all the gigahertz and megahertz coming off your cell phone and the baby monitor and the Wi-Fi, and delete out all the um, whatever else that's you know, affecting our bodies, you take all that out, what do you have left? You have the event. You have the double torus. You have the, scent, the um, black hole, the vortices, the, the spinning arms. You got that whole structure that I showed you. You have the creation of energy and matter. But if you load that up with your cell phone and the Wi-Fi and um, all, you know, the dirty electricity and all that stuff, my theory is that that event doesn't work very well and you don't get healing and you don't get the creation of new matter which is healing you don't get the energy like the ATP for example to heal so the scalar laser what it does is it cleans the space it cleans it up of all this garbage and then what do you have left you have pure space which is the event, the healing, the energy, the matter creation. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Did I lose anybody? This is heavy stuff, right? Yeah, it is heavy stuff. So I'll tell you, you know, living in Michigan, what do you do when the polar vortex is coming through and it's negative 30 degrees outside? Well, I studied the simharamine and physics. That's what I did. <laughs> Should we go to the next one? All right, so there's more information. This is... Nassim's um, academy.resonance.is, that's his website. And if you want more information, he's got a course that you can take and it would replace or I should augment all the physics that you've studied in the past. It augments it and you get the unified theory, you get the unified physics as a subject matter. And I've been through it and it's fantastic. And if you're into it, then get into it. So here's six modules. That's these are the six different um, subjects. So here we have a worldview shift. When you look at physics in this way, you see th everything different. I got a friend, he's an engineer at U of M and um, University of Michigan, and he studied all this. And he says, I have to rethink everything I ever learned in engineering. And he said that at the um, aeronautics um, building, they created a new rocket for a jet and the rocket created a torus field 
when they turn it on. And they were thinking, well, the torus field is going to slow it down. So they tried to shoot lasers through the, through the torus field to try to get rid of the torus field. And he told me that, and I just couldn't stop laughing because if you know this material, you know how to fix it. You know what to do with it. Okay, you don't want to delete the torus field. You want to make it as big as possible, and you want it to cover the whole plane. Okay, this is then the second module is thinking differently. The third one is modern physics, meaning like the standard model of physics, the way it's taught now, and who said what, and the history of it. It's fantastic. And then you have the unified physics. So this is what Nassim had come up with. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. And then ancient origins, because I talked about like the Temple of Osiris and the ancient cultures had, had they already figured all this stuff out earlier. They just didn't have equations like Nassim has. And then implications and applications. So what about the future? Like what about the technology of lifting off of gravity, you know, like anti-gravity machines and stuff like that. So next one. All right, and this is the website for the scalar laser. It's a TENS unit, so TENS, and then CAM stands for Crosby Advanced Medical. I do have to say that this is not a spiritual practice. This energy stuff from this laser has nothing to do with making somebody more self-determined or spiritually enlightened or, or to give an uplift spiritually. This is not a religious thing at all. This is purely physics. Um, can I tell your story, Debbie? Okay, so Debbie here, um, she's, when did you first come into this office? I first came in um, February 2011. 2011? What about earlier than that? I thought it was longer. Okay, so 2011, so it was four years ago, and wearing sunglasses, and uh, we tried a bunch of stuff because her eyes are very sensitive to light, and she gets migraines very easily. Okay, so her friend made these really super dark sunglasses, and she wears them inside the house and while driving. And um, we gave her supplements. And what really helped her actually was this scalar laser. And I did one treatment with her. It took like 20 minutes. And um, what happened, so then the cool thing about this technology is that you can t your body continues to heal after we turn this off. It heals for days. And I don't know if it's weeks. But people get better, like on the third day after they leave the office, their pain is now noticeably different. Or I got a guy with a tremor, like a Parkinson's tremor, and it's better. And the, after the first treatment, it was the fourth day, and his tremor was better. Okay, so it's, it continues to heal after we turn it off. So Debbie left the office. That was on a Thursday. She came back a week later. I walked into the room, and she's not wearing her sunglasses. I think it may be the first time I ever saw your eyes since you first came in to see me. So I said, what happened? And she said, well, Monday, you walked into the bathroom, and the light, there's eight lights over the vanity, so it's pretty bright. She had her sunglasses on, but it was too dark. You said it was actually painful. It was so dark. Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. So she had to take her sunglasses off, right, for the first time, being in the bathroom. And that was on the Monday, and then Tuesday it was better. She could look outside the window with no sunglasses. Wednesday, she's driving down the road with no sunglasses. And so it was phenomenal, right? Absolutely phenomenal. So this is what she said at her follow-up visit. She said that, she goes, I don't know if you remember, but I told you, she said, I'll, she said that she worked at the Ann Arbor newspaper when they were in business. And for a couple, correct me if I say anything wrong, for a couple hours a day during your job, you had to stand at one station. And next to it was a box, like maybe this tall, and it said, caution, high voltage, stay away, something like that, right? Close enough. But you were near it for, you know, extended period of time every day, and you worked at that place for how many years? Four years. And so her theory, even back then, was that box caused the migraines, the sensitivity to light, and destruction of the nerves, harm to the nerves, the brain, the eyes, the eyes just being an extension of the brain. So when we did the scalar laser, what did it do? It took that energy from this box that was locked in her head and cleared it out. And then what happened? Then the event horizon and the structure of space appeared with the creation of matter and energy from the black hole. And the spinning arms and the vortex up and, the, you know, and all that stuff could occur naturally. And then healing occurred. That's how that works. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. So... Um, 
So this guy, I got to talk about this guy with his tremor. So he um, flosses his teeth with the plastic pick with a little band of dental floss on it. And that's his test. And if, as he approaches his mouth, it starts to tremor. Well, after the first treatment, he could stop the tremor intentionally with his mind. And then, and he just keeps getting better as far as being able to, you know, control the tremor and it's less. And I've treated him maybe four or five times. That is phenomenal because that could be Parkinson's later and there's no cure for Parkinson's, right? Um, now, I just saw him today and he said that he got worse on Saturday morning for some reason. Just a couple days ago, he was worse. So I started asking him, what happened? Did you go to the dentist? Did you get something new? Did you buy a new product? Did you? And he said, oh, my basement flooded because a pipe burst and I know I have mold down there. I haven't run the dehumidifier all summer like that. So I'm like, okay, so I did our testing procedure and I found mold in his body. So the mold was an assault enough so that he got worse Saturday morning. But then, I mean, that was Friday, right? But he cleaned his basement and he did everything he could to dry it out. And then Saturday afternoon, Sunday, and Monday, he's better. He's back to his better state. Okay, so things like this happen, right? I have a woman, she's a, like a triathlete. She runs long distances. She's got this pain on the right side, down her leg. She can't stretch very far on this leg compared to the other leg. And I did the first treatment with her. Pain was gone. And uh, it was gone for like four days. She, she ran. She even tripped a couple times. But her pain was good. And then, then it hurt on Monday. I said, well, where were you on Monday? And she said she was at work. Okay, where were you at work when you first noticed it? I was at my desk. Okay, tell me what's at your desk. The computer, the phone. Oh, the Wi-Fi for the whole office is right at her desk. Oh my God. So I said, you got to get that Wi-Fi out of there because the scale of laser cleaned up all that uh, it, oh, by the way, it was right here. The Wi-Fi was right by her right hip. She's had this pain for four years or whatever, and she's been working at that desk for four years. Like, d it's date coincident, you know? So it was fascinating. But, so I got these stories where people, I got a guy with um, a bad uh, pain in his hip, both sides, knee muscles. He had trauma 25 years ago. He never took care of it, never had surgery. He went to a bunch of chiropractors. But he actually kind of like stumbles a little bit when he walks. He takes these tiny steps. But his pain is pretty much gone. And he keeps coming back because it's getting rid of his pain. After all these Did years. It take a number of times to... Yeah. Yeah, it takes a number of times, right. So we do the testing procedure to find out what to, what to treat next. Oh, now I got to tell you, this is the final part of this lecture. I'm going to tell you how to set this laser to treat what needs to be treated, okay? <clears throat> so I was talking about crystals, and uh, Marcel Vogel from IBM studied crystals, and he figured out how to cut a crystal so that it could heal the body really well. Liz, can you grab that one crystal? Thanks. And he also um, taught doctors how to use crystals for healing. And he taught a guy named Dr. Fulford, a DO, who gave his last lecture in 1997. This guy's brilliant. And then the, one of the audience members in 1997 is Dr. Crosby. Dr. Crosby is the guy that invented this laser. <clears throat> so what, Dr., what Marcel Vogel said was, remember the analogy I gave about the crystal radio? You got the AM radio tower sending a signal through the air, and the crystal picks up on it and it sings the song. So now, and so the AM radio is programming that crystal and the crystal puts out that sound. So here's a cut crystal the way that Marcel Vogel told, told, told everybody that this, this is what heals the body. I gotta tell you a story about this before I get back to this. I got this maybe four or five years ago, I can't remember. I never keep track. And my mom had been to a massage therapist a long time ago and this was in Mexico. After the massage, he took her neck and went crunch, crunch, like that, and cracked her neck completely unprofessionally and hurt her neck. 
So, and she was struggling with this pain for quite a while, her jaw and all this stuff. I put her on supplements, I adjusted her, trying to fix it. I had another chiropractor try to fix it. Nothing helped her. I pointed this at her jaw like this, and within 10 seconds she goes, <gasps> and all of her pain completely disappeared. And I didn't know how it worked, but I just, to I just told you how it works. It puts out that scalar waveform. So this laser is filled with crystals inside of it. So now, to get as specific as possible, you need to program this, and the way that you program it is with a radio tower. Now the radio tower is this. It's your brain. And you give, you tell, you uh, send a signal to this, the crystals in here, what to do and with intention and then you let it run for two minutes and then you find the next thing to heal and you set this again with your intention and that's how it works so when um, Dr. Crosby had been to Dr. Fulford's lecture on how to work with crystals Fulford said the future of 21st century medicine is crystalline energy and Fulford went home took the notes and stuck them on the bookshelf left it there. And then later, a patient started giving him crystals as a gift. And he put them on the bookshelf, forgot about them. And then one day, Fulford hurt his wrist. Six weeks later, it still hurts. And he's looking around like, what am I going to do? He sees the crystals on the bookshelf. He pulls them out, gets the notes from Dr. Fulford, points the crystal at the wrist, and intends for the crystal to heal it, and within a few seconds, the pain's gone. These crystals are good, for, they're fantastic for pain. And um, there are dentists who are, who are customers <coughs> of Dr. Um, Crosby, there are dentists that don't use Novocaine. They use this crystal laser, these scalar lasers.